Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My special guest today, Robert Powelson, a member of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, fondly known as FERC. So, Rob, thanks for joining me. Aaron, great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my, my pleasure. Uh, you know, let's talk about the commission. Uh, I've had uh, uh, Philip, I guess it was, uh, Mueller was on mm -hmm, the yep. show, of course, Cheryl LaFleur, some of your uh, contemporaries, pre predecessors as well. Uh, but uh, tell me right now, just so the audience knows, really the, the mission of the commission these days. Yeah, so I mean, as an agency, you know, we, as, as Senator Murkowski once said to me, we, we touch $500 billion of energy infrastructure in this country a year. That ranges from hydro facilities to interstate pipelines to long haul electric transmission lines. Uh, we do a lot of work on physical and cyber security. Uh, and then we kind of serve as the regulator of these organized markets. And uh, it's an amazing story in this country. You know, we just had a meeting with uh, representatives from China. You know, the, the, the U.S., in terms of where we are with energy production, with natural gas, um, and, 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 and clean tech investment, and they couple that now with uh, our leadership role with, with LNG exports, which the FERC touches, uh, it's a really exciting time at the FERC to to uh, to be in this arena of of you know being kind of the, the the agency that does infrastructure and we do it pretty well. I know when I was helping the agency, mm -hmm. it was a little uh, a little more boring. sleepy. You know, yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. sleepy. I like yep. that's a nice nice way to put it. Let's um, let's jump into some sure. of those topics. LNG, mm -hmm. uh, extraordinary story where originally several years ago we were looking at building LNG plants to get imported yep. uh, liquefied natural gas, then the conversion to, no, we want to export it, and, and now that industry uh, really still nascent, still in, mm -hmm. in the early stages, but the potential is extraordinary. Talk about that. What's the FERC's role in, in helping that? Sure. You know, LNG, to your point, I mean, in 2008 as a country, we were reliant upon gas imports into our market. Um, for me, it, it was an eye-opener to tour the Cove Point facility in Lusby, Maryland, which today, uh, I think within the last two weeks, took its first shipment of Marcellus molecules, by the way, being from Pennsylvania, um, and moving product uh, abroad, by the way, all that gas is under contract, to think that we go from 2008 to 2018, and we are now moving gas all over the world. Um, as I like to... You, something, something like, I think, over... Uh, 26 countries or something on that or just extraordinary extraordinary and um, as I like to say you know I, I uh, you know it is arguably one of the greatest peace dividends we have uh, to go into Europe and other parts of the air of the world that have resource constraints that we can bring gas into those markets and 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 it, to see how we've come full circle in our uh, production of natural gas the abundance of it and now the infrastructure investment around LNG, it's, it, it's exciting. How do we go about it? It's a process. You know, a, a, a developer, and there's some here, or many here uh, at, uh, at Sierra Week, who, you know, you go through a process. You underwrite a, a, a huge capital investment in the billions, and you go through a process of FERC permitting, demonstrate need for the project, and uh, upon there, with the Certificate of Public Convenience, you move forward to develop your, your, your LNG infrastructure. For me, I'll tell you, as a former chairman of, of, of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission where I regulate it, I had touch of Marcellus, to two things changed my world of, of LNG. One is we had a joint venture, uh, a, a joint partnership with Kosovo. We had a delegation come through that would tell us the horror stories of how they were treated on the Russian interstate pipeline, uh, how gas was disrupted during the winter uh, heating season. And then another experience for me was with our former governor going to Chile and meeting with now the newly elected or re-elected Sebastian Panera, who, who said, look, we're, we're going through a tectonic shift here in our power production, but we need gas. We need U.S. gas in our market. How do you get it to me? That was seven years ago. So it, it is just an amazing time to see how we're developing LNG, uh, how it's being embraced, how it's having great impacts in local communities, the Gulf uh, the eastern seaboard, and uh, now we're able to go from 2008, where we're importing it, to 
world dominance in the export markets. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I'm sure, uh, I mean, you mentioned a lot of the countries that are excited uh, to have the opportunity. I'm sure uh, the Russians aren't that pleased about what we're able to do. I, I'm sure they're not, and as I use the example of uh, being a good student of Model UN, which I, you know, was... was uh, you were I, in a few years I ago? Was a, I was a Model <laughs> UN guy in high school. And, Me too. And, and I, I'm proud to say that, yeah, this is a peace dividend that we can give to the world to help countries that want to get U.S. gas into their market cheaply and have it sourced and understand we do adhere to rule of law here in the U.S. Um, and we're a good trade partner. So I, I just like look at it as I'm extremely bullish on where the country is headed with LNG investment. All right. One of the uh, one of our guests before that we've had on the show, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan mm -hmm. from Alaska, Alaska yeah. obviously very focused on energy issues. Uh, and we've had Scott Pruitt on the show mm -hmm. talking about permitting. And, and yeah. how do you uh, and I'd be really interested in what the commission can do to improve the permitting process. And, and uh, Senator Sullivan's perspective was, you know, if you're doing a new project, we need to go through uh, a process that's thorough, that uh, addresses the key environmental issues, that, you know, doesn't leave anything, you know, no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. And we realize that can be costly and lengthy and expensive, but that's okay. But where we're doing a project, uh, which is essentially a maintenance or expansion where the environmental footprint is the same as an existing location, for example. Let's find a way to accelerate that. Uh, the kind of projects that you are involved in are pretty much almost all new. Uh, what can you do that still protects the environment uh, but makes the, the process less onerous? Well, first and foremost, uh, yeah, I think it's very important for, for uh, your viewing audience to understand that we, we don't just rubber stamp projects or support projects that don't have a demonstrated need. Uh, and more importantly, uh, there is a commitment, whether it's the interagency cooperation with the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, working with uh, sister organizations like the Army Corps, working with state environmental air regulators, that these projects, there's, there's embedded in the approval is environmental stewardship. Uh, I recognize these, some of these projects um, have certainly, um, you know, caused a little bit of, um, of hysteria in local communities. Some of it is, you know, unnecessary. The FERC, I, I will come off as sounding bias here, but we're not the agency that's really holding up projects. We're going about our business. I call it doing the boring good. We're going about hosting public input doing the rigorous underwriting of these projects, whether it's an interstate pipeline, uh, whether it's an LNG export application. And, and that's a good thing. As an independent agency, we're calibrated by statute, by uh, regulation that we've got to provide approvals. I can't say that for some of the other agencies. Now, in, what, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the current White House, there's a very, uh, there's a steadfast commitment for value engineering in the permitting process. It's got to be more agile, it's got to be nimble, and it's, it's, you know, we've got to cut down timelines and take, you know, get that capital deployed instead of causing some, uh, you know, we'll call it risk involved in these large-scale projects. Uh, and so the FAST Act is an example of that, and the FERC has been in, in that conversation. But I, I, I go to someone like a Terry Turpin who works at the FERC. Many people don't know who he is, but here's a guy who's been with us for well over a decade, um, and he's the with his team underwriting these projects, working with the stakeholders, and so I have peace of mind when I work with people like a Terry Turpin that at the end of the day, before that certificate of public convenience is issued, that I have peace of mind when I'm voting on approval that it's gone through a rigorous underwriting pro a prospect, uh, and that's good. That's good for all of us who are whether we're ratepayers or or end users of the commodity. All right, let Terry do the dirty work, right? Well, I don't know if it's dirty work. It's going to my earlier point of doing the boring good. He's, you know, we've got very, the one thing about the FERC is we are not a politically uh, driven organization. Our mission is based in, in statute and we have very highly competent uh, capacity within the organization from lawyers, accountants, engineers, to make these decisions, and that's a darn good thing for this country. Uh, and for all the commissioners, too. Uh, they make us look good sometimes in spite of ourselves, yes. <laughs> all right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with Robert Paulson in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse 
and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24 seven at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We are with Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Commissioner Rob Paulson. Rob, I mean, we, we were touching on a number of different subjects, including uh, permitting in the White House. I mean, wh what do you think the president and the White House would like to see the commission do differently than it has in the past 10 years or so? Well, I haven't had that conversation. Um, I've, I was interviewed uh, by Gary Cohn, who, uh, you, know, you know, the news of his departure, I, uh, a little upset to see him leave. He, he is uh, <clears throat> a, just an incredible success story in his own right and understands energy markets. Um, I think they look at us, many people in Washington, to your, when you worked at the FERC, as you said, it was a kind of a sleepy organization. Um, now it's kind of like, you know, whether it's a U.S. senator or one of our House Oversight members or a governor, um, people realize this is an agency that touches a lot of energy infrastructure in the country. And so the White House, I think, understands that. I've been blessed to, you know, the Gary Cohns and the Mike Cannizzaro's, um, the Secretary Perry's of the world. Um, you know, this is an agency that um, is, is well calibrated to address electric reliability, gas safety, uh, market regulation. Um, so I, I haven't had any requests to answer your question. It's almost like leave well enough alone. They have uh, the intellectual capacity to do their jobs. And that's a good thing. That's why we're an independent agency. Um, and we have to, we're calibrated to make decisions. And that, that, um, um, it, and it's, you know, we don't get caught up in, you know, I might be a Republican, but Cheryl LaFleur is a Democrat. I, you never approach your decision making in partisan politic posture. It's more, you know, uh, collegiality and idea and, and solution. We, we, we have to work together. And that's what I like most about this job. It's what I like most about my prior life as a state regulator. So actually, I think the commission has been like that uh, for eternity. Right. Yep. I, I don't think that's changed. Uh, we've talked about regulation. We've talked a little bit. You touched on pipelines. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the commission plays a major role in, in the approval of new pipelines. I've been fascinated by uh, the increase in the last several years of protests against certain pipelines. Of course, you had Keystone uh, XL and all that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as an environmentalist, uh, I'm a big fan of pipelines because they've always struck me as much more environmentally sound than uh, doing transmission, for example, of oil by truck. Right. Um, tell me your take on all that and, and uh, where there's an education gap, if there is one. Well, you're an environmentalist. I'm an environmentalist, too. And uh, I look at this as um, the industry, and I served on our former governor in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf's Pipeline Safety Task Force, where Pennsylvania as a state um, has done a remarkable job kind of putting best practices in place around shale gas development and pipeline development. 
Um, and I look at that in my new role here at the FERC of embedding in our processes, as Chairman McIntyre has set forth a conversation on looking at the 1999 policy statement around uh, the, the need doctrine for pipelines. Some people have argued that the FERC has, you know, never, never has uh, seen a pipeline it didn't like. Well, I'm here to tell your listening audience that's not the case. Um, but the environmental stewardship piece, uh, it, 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 um, it has become more combative. We, we know that uh, FERC commissioners get uh, protesters at their home. Uh, we have... Uh, Th that's a new one, by the yes, way. Yes, <laughs> it is a new one. Um, and it's a great thing about this country. Everybody has that First Amendment right, except at times it can get a little disruptive when you're going through a Senate confirmation process or you're trying to conduct an open meeting. Um, and so we, we are recognizing that working with, again, working with states and listening to the states who are closer to the problem and closer to the, maybe the infrastructure, listening to them, providing adequate public input, um, these are all things that people want to have peace of mind as you're going through an approval process. And then the safety piece. You know, the industry has a moral responsibility to put safety you know, the Ernest J. Pipeline system, by way of background, is the safest form of transportation in our country. We don't talk about that often, but it is the reality. But you know, consumers and residents where these impacts are taking place uh, need to have peace of mind that things are done safely and that the operator is held accountable for missteps. And I like to use the example. You can drive 70 mile, 75 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. That's why we have state troopers. The same holds true with these pipeline operators for missteps, and we find them, we kind of put them in the penalty box, and I look at this as we got to continue to do that because people, again, it's to your, to your FERC experience, to my FERC experience, like think about when we built the interstate pipeline, this country had half the population it had today. Um, and, you know, you're going through impacted areas and, you know, there has to be, you know, the people who are impacted need to have the peace of mind that, okay, I get it, I'm going to be inconvenienced by the trenching of this pipe, but when it's, you know, when the fescue and the grass is laid over, I know that it's going to be inspected and I know that it's bringing a product, whether it's to my home or business, and by the way, we're doing it in a least cost environment. That's a good thing. And by the way, we're addressing believe it or not, climate in that conversation as well. Um, you know, gas is, is a clean burning resource. Well, certainly uh, when you look at what the United States has accomplished in reducing greenhouse gas emissions because of the transition uh, to using natural gas instead of, for example, coal, uh, certainly the Marcellus uh, play in your state, your home state, mm -hmm. has played a very big role in that and, and is continuing to play a very two, big two role. Two fact points on Marcellus, and I said it earlier this morning. Wholesale power prices in PJM from 2008 to today have dropped by close to 60%. That, by the way, in 2008, we had $14 per MMBTU gas. We're at three, and you talk to most of the really smart guys here at CIRA, they don't see a $4 gas scenario. It's more like $3 over the next decade. The second point is if you're a local gas distribution customer, the, the purchase costs, what we call the gas purchase costs off the interstate pipeline to supply you as a customer, those LDC gas purchase costs have dropped on average in Pennsylvania through, through uh, seven LDCs by 72%. That's incredible, not to mention behind that, the reductions in NOx, SOx, and mercury in the entire PJM footprint of over 32% with no clean power plan on the books. It's pretty impressive. All right, when everyone's saying NOx and SOx, talking about obviously... Particulate know, that comes out of the smokestack or... Whether it's sulfur, nitrogen, nitrogen whatever. Mercury. Uh, the works. All right, we're going to take our last break. We'll be back with Rob to wrap up. We're going to talk about uh, cyber warfare and the grid. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse, and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus 
of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch The Aaron Harbor Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. Watch the Aaron Harper Show. I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harper Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harper, host of the Aaron Harper Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harper Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We're with Robert Paulson of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So you know, we, we haven't touched really on cyber and cyber issues. I mean, with uh, the Internet controlling everything and the Russians controlling half of us or whatever the case may be. Uh, what, uh, what is uh, the commission's involvement in ensuring that uh, from a cyber perspective the grid for example is hardened enough and uh, is adequately tested and th that we're really prepared uh, for even if it's not just the cyber attacks that occur daily uh, now but something really intrusive. Yeah, the, the, the cyber discussion that started under the leadership of former chairman Wellinghoff to former Chairman LaFleur to our current chairman. And by the way, Chairman Wellenoff has also been a guest on the show. Oh, great. Well, see, I told you, I'm in rarefied air here with this group. <laughs> um, cyber is dominating the conversation, it, whether it's in Washington or it's with re, you know, utilities uh, at the state level, uh, governor's offices. You know, if you would have told me 10 years ago, what, Rob, could you define what a fusion center is? I, I, I couldn't have told you that. 10, how about five? Maybe five, I, you're probably right. I mean, I don't know, if I, 10, let's go with 10. But anyway, you look at the threat vectors and how they're changing and the proliferation of bad actors out there that want to get into industrial control systems and wreak havoc on our bulk power system. It's real time. It is uh, from the DOD to the security, the national security of the country to working with the DOE. And we're blessed at the FERC to have a guy like Joe McClellan, who is, I call him our cyber czar. I don't know if you should use the word czar in the current, but he, he is, Joe has been a phenomenal uh, leader and, and been very proactive in outreaching to the states. My state was one of the first states, by the way, to go through a FERC cyber training. And what I, what I bring that up is states are really struggling to build this capacity within state public utility commissions. And the FERC, believe it or not, you never thought you'd hear this, a federal agency going out and helping and providing that resource. And so cyber is, um, it is going to continue, you know, long past my tenure at the FERC you know, management audits that are going on, going on at local public utility commissions where we'd ask you to just to check a box, do you have a cyber plan? Now we're asking things like, do you have, uh, how, many, how, many, how many penetration tests have you done? What's your investment around cyber? We talked earlier, still in the post-Metcalf world, of the physical cyber issue, or physical security issues that are out there. And so for the FERC, going back, we'll say 10 years ago, cyber was not even on the whiteboard now it is really a, a one or two priority for us. Do you uh, foresee the possible role of the commission uh, having a, uh, actually setting up an operation to test the uh, cyber 
uh, capabilities, as it were, in terms of protection uh, of the, you know, how hardened each state is or each system, utilities, et cetera. So you have a uniform evaluation across the country of how well you're doing. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're in typical patchwork mode of, who, you know, one state's much further ahead than another state. Um, I also look at the FERC in terms of, you know, being active with um, working with partners like NERC and EPRI. You know, I will just say this. One black sky event, tabletop exercise, would change anybody's view of, oh, my God, what happens if we lose our power to the cascading events of not having water service and, God forbid, we can't use cell phones or wireless devices. Um, this, is, this is stuff that, again, is really driving the conversation, um, and, it, and it's, a, it's a very proactive conversation. It's a very fluid conversation, but it is alarming. As I go through cy cybersecurity briefings, um, we, we need to continue to, uh, to remain diligent in our approach and, and, and staying ahead of the curve here and helping, helping where states need to build these capacity. You don't want to be getting a call from your governor saying, like, wh why did this happen and what are you doing to respond? And that's where I think the FERC's playing a key role working with, with, our, with our state partners. All right, so a lot of this is related to the grid. Talk about your, your sense uh, of the demands on the grid today, mm -hmm. where they're going in the future, uh, and, and what needs to be done to, uh, what upgrades are really needed and how are those going to occur? You know, the grid as we know it, um, you know, some would have a 1980 version definition of what baseload is, and that version has changed uh, radically in the world we're in today. And let me, let me set that up in, in this context. Um, first of all, the way we generate, transmit, and distribute power is changing. One, we're seeing, because of shale, a proliferation of, of natural gas uh, development, and we're seeing it in our power sector. 10% uh, of our bulk power delivery last year came from renewable energy. We're going to continue to see increased investment in renewables. And then I call it the in front and behind the meter technologies where in this country right now, there's something like 70 million smart meters that are deployed. Uh, Pennsylvania, I'm proud to say, we, have full, we will have full deployment by 2021. But the, there's no such thing anymore as the, the plain vanilla customer. The customer is a prosumer of energy, um, and that, uh, that is driving a lot of real innovation in, in the sector. Power plants are getting cleaner. I hate to say this, I'm going to take exception to what I'm going to say, but we're not building 1,200 megawatt cathedrals anymore in the U.S. We're building really efficient um, power plants, and now comes the iteration of battery storage. Who would have thunk that a decade ago? Technologies like oxidized fuel cells, um, solar uh, investment in large-scale utility project investment around solar, wind that was $0.40, cent, $40 a megawatt hour coming in now at a $3 per kW price point in the XL footprint. These are like just game changers. And um, it, it's amazing to see the U.S. kind of leading that. Like we all, you know, we're skeptics like, oh, you know, this, this wind production, it just can't be sustained. We're in Texas right now, and Texas is the number one wind producer in the U.S. And you look at Texas on a worldwide basis, I think fourth or fifth largest wind production uh, state in the world. That's amazing. So, so I'm like, I'm bullish on where our bulk power system's headed. Let's not underestimate. We've got to continue to address reliability. We're going to see more states address things like climate goals and energy efficiency, and that's all good. States are leading that. But um, it's an exciting time for the, for, the, for the bulk power system. It's to your for early FERC experience. Y you guys weren't taught back then. You probably couldn't imagine what it looks like today. No, no. We were still talking coal. And so like, that's yeah, a... I mean, that, that's another issue. All right, I want to thank my guest, Robert Paulson. Rob, thanks so Aaron, much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. It was great having you on the show. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Aaron Harbour. We'll see you next time.
please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.